In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God and our Mother, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So good afternoon. We're going to be talking about Garabandal tonight because this is very up to date. There are things that come up every now and then, and we've been hearing a lot of news recently. And there's some truths, like half-truths, that have come to our attention recently, and that's why the subtitle to this talk is Three Half-Truths That Can Be Detrimental. And this is something that's gone on forever throughout history because the gospel is constantly being reinterpreted. We have the Protestants, the Orthodox Church, the Advent, Seventh-day Advent Church, and everyone has their own interpretation. And so the Catholic Church has to explain the deposit of faith that has been entrusted to her and also let others know about it. And within this deposit, which we consider from this point of the, super, the faith, the supernatural faith, there are some things that can help us. The Catechism talks about private revelations as a help, a way of helping the, the gospel be made known in our own lives. And that's, for example, um, Juan Diego asks the bishop to build a basilica in Guadalupe because Our Lady performs a miracle in, in the Tilma. And 500 years later, John Paul II says that because of the, con the apparitions of Garibandal in, in the 1500s, just 30 years after the discovery of, the, of America, half of the continent has been converted. And this is because of the Marian operations that took place there. That's what John Paul II says. So Marian operations must have a very great strength. She is able to help us, the entire church, in a very, very strong way. And we also see Garabandal in the midst of all of this. And Garabandal coincides with the Second Vatican Council, which was such a strong moment in the church, very important. It was just as the Council of Trent was important in the 16th century and the first councils that went on in the church in the very beginning. And within these half-truths, we've found with at times that Garibandal has been a, um, kind of set in against um, the Second Vatican Council. And some people think that there's an opposition between Garibandal and the Second Vatican Council. They talk about the end times what Garibantal you know, talks about the end times is like this battle. But we have to understand this well, because if not, we're fighting against heresies. As far as the gospel goes, and just half-truths and things that have been twisted. Because apparitions are not part of the deposit of faith, but they are a help, a help to understand the faith. And one of the things that we have to have very clear is that the God, all of the bishops that have talked about Garibandal, they have all said that Garibandal's message is correct and coherent with the deposit of, the deposit of faith. Some people say that Garibandal has been rejected, and so you can't go to Garibandal. That's where the lies start to come in. In in the first few moments, um, the missionaries had a very hard time. In 67, they were rejected because a bishop interviewed the four visionaries, the four girls who saw Lady and Garibandal, and he published a note declaring that the visionaries have also affirmed that everything has just been a child's prank. And unfortunately, this bishop died two years, two months in May 8th, just two months after he, he signed this note. And there was no time for the bishop to realize that the, 
the girls had denied the apparitions in a moment of, of great pressure. Because someone told one of the girls, a priest told Conchita, if you do not deny publicly the apparitions, I will deny you absolution. And for Conchita, this was incredibly difficult. We can remember the three little past uh, shepherd children in Fatima who were threatened with being burnt in oil. The girls in Garibandal were, were threatened with being um, excommunicated. And this was very hard for them. And Monsignor Bishop Puchol, he died just two months after this, this note that was published. And there was no time for things to be corrected before he, before he passed away. There was an interview that, took, that went on for seven hours. And during this interview, Conchita um, was under a lot, a lot of pressure. And Gutierrez Gonzalez um, talks about this, this interview that took place. And the only thing that Conchita said during, um, during this interview was like, okay, if the other girls, if the other girls have denied the, the apparitions that I guess my apparitions must not have been true either. But all four of the girls over the course of time um, have, have gone back to saying that that the apparitions really did take place. And the girls have gone back to say several times, you know, I don't know how to explain the things that I'm often asked. They always ask me, like, how did I fake the levitations? How did I fake the miracle? How did I fake, you know, all of us getting there at the same time? And I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how to say how I faked it because <laughs> it, it wasn't, I wasn't faking. So there was a commission, the first commission. Bishop Duval was a member of the first commission. And he tried several times after that once he was actually bishop because he formed part of the commission before he was the bishop. Um, later on when he was named Bishop of Santander, uh, he tried to um, form a second commission in 1977, in 1988, and 1989. Um, Mariloli took a cross, a crucifix, to, to Bishop Deval um, to the hospital where he was suffering from, from cancer and dying. Um, and he was actually cured from, by kissing the, that crucifix. And so he tried three times to... Um, to assign a second commission. And in August of 1989, he finally was able to do so. And we've seen in Unstoppable Waterfall that the director of this second commission didn't have faith. And the report that was kind of published as a result of this was sent over to Rome. There was a theological section to this investigation as well. But when you talk it to the theologians who formed a part of that team, you can read my, my thesis, it's, it's all there. This theologian says that the, the only thing the theologians did during the second commission was listen to the tapes that were already recorded and read books that were already written. They didn't interview any of the girls. They didn't talk to anyone who was in the actual um, apparitions. And 30 years have gone by since the first commission. In 1992, Ratzinger writes a letter from Rome. He's head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith at the time. And what he says, he, he writes back to the, to the commission and he says, you know what, if you'd like to do something right now, what you can do is, is you can write another note saying that non constat is what you should what you can describe as kind of the the conclusion of of the investigation what does that mean theology explains this in a very very simple way the latin itself the latin itself is is very is very clearly let's look at the latin first before going to to the english non constat there's three options that the church can give 
And this is explained by Um, Manfred Hawk in 2015, and he's a member of the Pontifical International Marian Academy, and he explains the three options that the church can give when judging a Marian apparition. And he says, you can say, constat su supernalitate, constat de non supernalitate, or non constat de super supernalitate. And so you can either affirm that it's supernatural, affirm that it's not supernatural. So you either affirm it or reject it. Or the third one is to say that we are unable to ascertain the divine origin. We're not sure. And we can think of um, St. John, for example, who ran with St. Peter to see the tomb of our Lord. And John and Peter run to see the empty tomb of our Lord and John stops. John stops before he gets to the, when he gets to the tomb to wait for Peter. And this is kind of a, uh, a way of understanding the hierarchy of the church in John 20. John stops and he waits for Peter. But John later looking into the tomb, he sees, he sees what Jesus had been wrapped in and he believed. There's a supernatural faith going on here. In the case of apparitions, we're not talking about supernatural faith that has been infused into the soul. We're actually talking about a certainty that helps us to reach this supernatural faith. This supernatural faith always comes from God. Apparitions are also a gift from, from God, the same as a homily or a, a document of the magisterium. They're all helps in order to grow in faith. St. Thomas Aquinas says that it's a help to grow in our faith. Marian apparitions are meant to aid us in our faith. And so Cardinal Ratzinger in 1992 says that right now is non constat. It remains open. We're unsure about its, its divine origin. We don't have enough facts. And that's what is published. That's the official, um, that's what Garibandal is up, up until now. Non constat. It remains open. In 1966, if I remember correctly, in January of 1966, Conchita was actually interviewed by Cardinal Octaviani, who was a member of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith at the time. And after interviewing her, he came out and was speaking with a priest who had brought Conchita. And Octaviani said, this is the most interesting um, case that I have right now to study. Jacinta was also interviewed. In April of 1996, Deval talks about this as well. He's the one who was healed in Garibando. And he is going to say to Mother Nieves de Garcia, she was a religious sister who was Conchita's spiritual guide, while she was going through her doubts in 67 and 68, shortly after the declarations that she made to Bishop Fulchol, Mother Nieves said that Conchita had spoken, that Monsignor Deval had spoken to her about what Ratzinger had said. When Ratzinger was there in Madrid in El Escorial, he was there in the University of Madrid for a couple of um, courses, and he actually encouraged Deval to continue to study Garibanda, and that's what happened. Deval prepared a study on Garibanda, and he retired in 91, and shortly after July 91, he sent his study to Ratzinger, and that's what Ratzinger read. And it was based on this study that Deval sent him in 1991, that in 1992, Ratzinger sent his letter back and said that if you'd like to publish a note that says non constat, that's what you should do right now. It remains open. And so the church says Garibandal is still, it's open. St. Thomas Aquinas says that in everything that is essential, we all have to agree. In everything, 
there must be charity and what can be where there's opinions we have to leave everyone free an example of this would be the vow of the those who are in favor of the immaculate the doctrine of the immaculate conception in spain for centuries before the dogma was actually approved this dogma was defended in spain in a very very powerful way And so there was time where the dogma of the Immaculate was kind of, um, you were able to take opinions on it and that's where you have to leave freedom. There's a privilege in, um, in Spain that has been granted to Spain that they're actually allowed to wear a blue chasuble um, while celebrating the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And it's precisely because Spain was so in favor of the Immaculate Conception while it was still well, uh, you were still able to take opinions on, on the matter before the dogma was actually actually declared. And there's many, many people who have testified the fact that they have been very powerfully touched by our Blessed Mother through Garibanda. I was... I was listening to someone this summer talking about Garibanda, and they said, what has encouraged me in my faith, what has kept me going really, is just the message of Garibanda, and this is young people as well. It's very often that I find myself with young people who have been touched by our Lady's message in Garibanda, and we have to say as well that if the church, we, we have to move ourselves as well. We have to take action. In Lumen Gentium number 12, it says, these charisms, whether they be more outstanding or the more simple and widely diffused, are to be received with thanksgiving and consolation, for they are perfectly suited to and useful for the needs of the church. Extraordinary gifts are not to be sought after, nor are the fruits of apostolic labor to be presumptuously expected from their use. But judgment as to their genuinity and proper use belongs to those who are appropriate leaders in the church to whose special competence it belongs, not indeed to extinguish the spirit, but to test all things and hold fast to what is good. This is Lumen Gentium number 12. So where we find graces that are being poured out, when a 19 year old comes up to you and says to you, you know, I've started going to daily mass ever since I watched the documentary on Garibandal, this is incredible. You really have to stop and say, God is working here. He's touching souls here and now. And so we cannot quench the spirit. We can't quench this fire that is beginning to burn. We can't ignore what's going on. And if we do, this would be a great responsibility for the shepherds of the church. And what we have to do is actually help them to be able to fulfill their tasks because it's not always as easy as we think it is. It's not simple, but we have to encourage the hierarchy to have kind of this, to give their hearts over to this, to do everything they can, because the fruits coming out of Garibandal now are so immense. There's physical healings that are still going on today. There's conversions, vocations. I've heard a priest crying, saying to me, I owe everything to Garibandal, to Our Lady of Garibandal, and there's another priest who said the same thing to me, but without crying. <laughs> there's so many testimonies and witnesses. And all of these testimonies are very um, necessary and helpful. But especially we have to pay attention to these testimonies, which are, are so powerful and help us to see things so clearly. I think we've touched this more or less i think we've talked about everything we have to talk about at this point uh, and the thing is that the church has the duty to examine everything to study everything and to live with this openness and in garibandal what we see is that in the first commission the of the members of the first commission both the doctor and 
um, Bishop Juan Antonio Leval, who was on the first commission, they both said that a second study had to be carried out because what the first study wasn't complete. It wasn't complete and it was, we don't have time to talk about all of this too much right now. But I do think it's important that we look at this right now. And there's kind of three reasons. There's kind of three reasons why he's talking about a priest who was Conchita's um, confessor for a while. And he says that there are three possible explanations behind the, the apparitions. The first possible explanation is that it comes from a natural origin. And what Gareth says is that this is impossible. <laughs> he rejects the natural origin of the ph phenomena. It's impossible. Seeing everything that happened, it's impossible. And the second possible explanation is for it to come from preternatural origin. That means from the demon or demons, because they're real and they exist and they do have power to intervene. But Gera is going to say that this is impossible, that it comes from the enemy, because because the, the, the devil would not, it goes back to what Jesus says in the gospel, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And there's so many examples in Garabandal of defending church doctrine, of defending especially families and matrimonies in the sacrament of matrimony. Our Blessed Mother blessed wedding wings because she wanted to underline the importance of that, of that sacrament. And so all of those kind of fruits are not gonna come from the enemy. And so, according to Father Manuel Guerra, there's only one other option. It must have a supernatural option, origin, a supernatural origin. And he says, he concludes his assessment by pointing out that the official declaration of the supernatural origin is the responsibility of the Holy See, which has not yet pronounced itself in a definitive manner. So the matter is still open. The case remains open. So there are four criteria, norms, that the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith gives to help to assess alleged operations. And the first norm that the Congregation gives is the credibility of the witnesses, the credibility of, of the visionaries. And this is clearly true in Garibandal. The witnesses are credible, and even the confessor of the girls says that their testimony is credible. So the second norm is the truth of the phenomena, the historical study of the facts of everything that took place. And there were times that there were even 20,000 people there witnessing the facts. Don Valentin, in one of his, he was the parish priest at the time, in one of, the think, uh, one of his notebooks, he said that many people came up just out of curiosity, but I have seen grown men cry there because so many people have been touched. We can listen to the testimony of Roman Martin de Ferro, and he says that I felt when I, in one of the ecstasies when I saw the girls, I just experienced the love of our Blessed Mother, the love of heaven for me, how God cares about my salvation and the church today. This is what the witnesses say. These help us to indicate. These are indicators, really, of the credibility of everything. Okay, so there's the first one is the credibility of the witnesses and the, and the visionaries. The second one is the truth of the phenomena going on. The third one is the doctrine. As I mentioned before, all of the bishops have commented on the message unanimously, saying that the messages are in accord with the truths of the faith. And the fourth norm set forth by the congregation is the fruits. What are the fruits that we see? Love for the Eucharist, the tabernacle, sacrifices, meditating on the passion. How can this come from the devil? There's real conversions and healings for over 60 years now. So looking at the church right now, the, the, the church has to examine these four points. And, and this is what is going to help the hierarchy to be able to make a decision on Garibandal.
Okay, so this is kind of the first the first point of the talk. Because a lot of people have reje rejected the apparition saying that they're not true. How are we going to reject the apparitions? There's some people who say that based on the gospels, you can't accept the, the apparitions. But that's just it's just not the case. There's so many examples of other apparitions. In the apparition of Our Lady of, of the Pillar, which is an apparition in Spain. So we're gonna move on to the second place, second point right now. We're gonna talk about the end of the end times. There's an idea that's kind of floating around right now that says when you there's going to be third, three popes, then we'll get to the end times, and then there's going to be an anti-pope. I don't know where this comes from. I don't know why people say this, but this does not come from Garibanda. The Antichrist, the word Antichrist does not appear in the messages of Garibanda. July 3rd, sixty three, nineteen 1963, it's the day that John the 23rd died. And Conchita said to her mother, the bells are ringing. And she said, oh, it must be for the Pope. It must, it must be the Pope. And, Conchita, and she responded by saying, oh, there's must only be, there's only three Popes left. That's what Our Lady told me. And her mom reacted saying, do you mean the end of the world is coming? Because if there's no more Popes, there must be the end of the world. But Our Lady didn't say the end of the world. She said the end times. Isn't it the same? I don't know. I don't know, is what she responded. And so how is the world going to continue to go on if there's not going to be any more popes? She didn't say, and the girl responded, Our Lady didn't say that there weren't going to be any more popes. What we have to do is examine what does end time mean? But... End times is not equivalent to the end of the world. This is the expression that Our Lady chose to use, the end times, the end, kind of a change of error, era. And these are terms that kind of come up in the Bible as well. And it's important to keep that in mind. It's one of those terms that kind of leaves things open. We're never going to have answers to all of our questions. And anyone who wants to have an answer for everything is just going to have a problem. This is something that, Saint Fran that Pope Francis calls Gnosticism. We want to know everything now. We want to have everything tied down and understood, but things are not that simple. But there are some things here that we do know. And end times, it's true that it probably does talk to us about a change that's going to happen. Something serious is going to happen. John Paul II, in his message to the participants in the congregation, the World Congress of Ecclesial Movements in May of 1998, he says, today I perceive the fruits of the springtime of the church announced by the Second Vatican Council. He says, I'm already seeing the fruits of that springtime. Their presence is encouraging. So there's growth going on here. John Paul II saw the first fruits of the springtime of the church. And you could be thinking, well, I don't see them right now. Benedict the Sixteenth, when he talks in his um, book called Last Conversations with Peter Seewald, um, he actually talks about what what end times could mean. Seewald asks him, "Do you see yourself as the last pope of an old era, or the first of a new era?" And Benedict the Sixteenth said, "I would say that I am between two eras. 
I no longer belong to the old world, but neither does the new one really exist yet. This is really funny. I find this really funny because there's some Garibandal um, scholars who would say that within these three popes, Our Lady talked about, t told Conchita that there would be a pope that would, wouldn't last very long and that, the, that she actually wasn't counting him. So, so we're talking about Paul VI, John Paul I, who only lasted 33 days, John Paul II, and then Benedict XVI. And then we would enter into the end times or uh, the end of time with Pope Francis. But Benedict XVI says, I no longer belong to the old world, but I don't know whether I'm actually part of the new one. What he says is that history itself will tell this. Because the division of history into ages always takes place in the past. It is only in hindsight that one can see how the movements have passed and you can talk about a change of errors. So moving on to Pope Francis in his speech to the Roman Curia on the reason of Chris, the meaning of Christmas. 21st of December, 2019. It's almost a year since he said this. He said, we are not simply living in a time of change, but in a change of era. There you have it. The, a healthy attitude is one of conversion, which is based on fidelity to the deposit of the faith and to the tradition. And that's why it's so important when they start to talk to us about rupture and change. The third idea that we're going to talk about in just in, in very briefly is going to be traditionalism. When we talk about these half truths, you know, we have to talk about that because we have, we affirm tradition, but we can't affirm traditionalism. But we'll talk about that in a moment. And so the Pope is saying that the healthy attitude of the solution in these in this change of era era is fidelity fidelity to the deposit of faith and to tradition in affirming what the Church has taught throughout all of time. The second secret of Fatima, when you, when you look for the, the, the third secret, because John Paul II read it and then the Ratzinger published it later on, it says, finally, or in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. But in the end of what? Is it in the end, at the end of time? And that's what we don't know. We know that our Blessed Mother says that the Lord wants to establish the triumph, the reign of her Immaculate Heart in the end. In the end, her heart will triumph. It could be the end of time. That's what a lot of, we have, that's how we have to understand this, this change of era. I'm trying to see how to um, piece Garibandal into this. <clears throat> Garibandal announced that hard times would come, that there would be a time of tribulation. It wouldn't be the punishment yet. It wouldn't be the prophetic signs announced in Garibandal as of yet, those signs announced in Fatima as well, but there would be a great time of anguish in the world and a persecution for the church. And the church would appear to be almost at the point of disappearing. And what would that be called? Our Lady responded, communism. Conchita asked her spiritual director, Mother Nieves, what does communism mean? And it's similar to what happened to St. Bernadette there, who told, who said to her, her parish priest, she said, I, the, the lady says, I am the Immaculate Conception. And the parish priest said, it's impossible for, for this girl to know that. This do, the dogma had been published just a couple of years beforehand. There's no way that she could know what that means. But we insist we can't see a figure of the Antichrist in, in the fourth pope here. 
Garibandal never mentions anything like that. They even asked Conchita at one point, so there's, there's, there won't be any more popes? And she responded by saying, Our Lady didn't say that. She, but she said, the, the church cannot exist without the pope. And the apparitions talk to us over and over again about this love for the priests, love for the hierarchy, the need to pray for them. And in a couple of places, Jacinta and Conchita as well, they say, Our Lady talks to us about the priests every day. She says that we have to pray for them. We should look upon them with, with trust and love and pray for them, not criticize them. Very good. Okay. Okay. So it is true that in Garibanda, there is a strong critique against bishops, cardinals, and priests saying that many are following the road to perdition and they take with them many other souls. But this is not everything that Garibandal says. This is something that Our Lady said on June 18, 65. She said it once, but every day she spoke about the priests to the girls. Dr. Celestine Ortiz, he, he was a doctor in Santander and he was present in a lot of the apparitions. He says, one day after ecstasies, we asked Marty Loli, what did Our Lady say to you? She said, Our Lady said that I should make sacrifices, do sacrifices for the holiness of priests so that they can take many souls to Christ. Because sometimes we can have the idea in our heads that Garibandal, it just encourages us to have this like critical spirit. But it's not the case. First Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the prophecies. Examine all things and hold fast to that which is good. Mariloli said that our lady said that the world is, is worse and worse and we need holy priests in order to help us. Our Lady also told her on a third occasion to pray in a special way for priests who want to leave the priesthood. In 1961 and 1962, this is when she told this to Mar Mariloli, there wasn't this strong crisis in the priesthood in all of the secularizations that took place afterwards after the, the council. This that starts to happen in 1964, 1965, 60,000 priests leave the priesthood. Mariloli is saying, Our Lady asked me to pray in a very, very special way for the priests who want to leave the priesthood so that they continue to be priests, because if not, it would be such a pity for her. And so our, the girls here are talking about the crisis within the church, and Our Lady is encouraging them to pray for them and to make sacrifices for them. And I think that what we have to see clearly here is that Our Lady is asking us to pray for the church. We're living very difficult times. But our Blessed Mother, when she announces all of this to us, she gives us the security as well of being with us. She told us this before, but now she is accompanying us with special graces to be able to live this well. So the third point that I mentioned just a moment, we're going to talk about traditionalism or fundamentalism. Garibandal has been accused accused of rejecting the Second Vatican Council. And it's it's clear that we can't if you look at the apparitions and everything that goes on there. And you, if you have it all in your hands, you can't say that Garibandal is against the Second Vatican Council, you just can't. Looking at the history of the facts, everything that took on, the council started on October 11th, 15 days before in September, 
Luis Naves came to Garibandal and he, he recorded the ecstasies. And you know what he recorded? What he taped? Don, Don Valentin is talking about that as, well, that as well. It's the 26th of September. He said, while one of the priests was praying, the Angelus, he he was there with with the girls in ecstasies and the girls were heard mentioning something of the council he said the ecstasies lasted about an hour that day the council said conchita this is this is what she was heard to say on and the, the tape recorder that they had, they hear, you can hear Conchita speaking and she says the following, this is what she says. The council said Conchita, is it the biggest of all? Will it be a success? How good, then they will know you better and you will be happier. So our lady was obviously talking to her about Second Vatican Council. We don't know what Our Lady was saying. All we hear is Conchita's response to Our Lady. But what Conchita says is, oh, is it the is it the biggest or the greatest of all councils? What must have Our Lady have said to her? And it's clear that it was the biggest council that has ever taken place. There were 2,625 church fathers participating in the Second Vatican Council. In Nicaea, there were 318. In the first council of Constantinople, there were about 150 bishops. In Chalcedon, there were 452. In Trent, there were about 232. So the Second Vatican Council is clearly the biggest, the biggest council that has ever taken place. This first Vatican Council only had about 700 bishops participating. The Second Vatican Council, there's 2,625, and it's also the biggest in terms of the, the number and breadth of the documents that were published. And Conchita also says, oh, so how good, then you will be better known. And so based on this intervention between our Blessed Mother and Conchita, I don't know how people affirm that Garibandal is against the Second Vatican Council. And many times, traditionalists have actually had to leave Garibandal behind. And this isn't something that I'm saying, this is something that, that Pescara said in his book. And Lafiniere is, is the one who tells us this story that we just listened to. In another ecstasies, on the 11th of October, which is the day that the council was sol solemnly opened, there's a priest from Asturias who was there in Garibandal that very night, and he spent the entire night without sleeping, waiting for Conchita to fall into ecstasies. And Conchita asked them, what, what time do you think the ecstasy is going to, to start? And everyone kind of gave their opinion out when they thought it might start. And she said, and this priest responded by saying, I think it's going to start at eight in the morning, which is when the council is going to start. And Conchita, the radio in her house was on, and and the council had just started. The procession of church fathers was already underway. And all of a sudden the priest realized that Conchita had just entered into ecstasies. The first, on the 4th of October, Thank you.
he's gone back to talk about what we what he mentioned at the beginning. Sorry, he's talk, he's gone back to talk about um, the first commission and everything that went on during the the first commission that was um, later proved to have been a commission that didn't actually study the the apparitions. So going going back to the story that he just told about this this second ecstasies that coincided actually with um, the beginning of the Second Vatican Council. She was, the girl was asked, Conchita was asked if Our Lady had said anything about right before I'm sorry, he's jumped back and forth a couple of times. Um, so on the 11th October, which is when the Second Vatican Council actually began, that's when this, the girl was in ecstasy and the priest from Asturias was there witnessing the ecstasy. So the 4th of October, which was just before that, um, the bishop had actually written the note that we mentioned at the beginning about prohibiting people from being able to go up to Garibandal and visit. So during the ecstasy of, the, of October 11th, after the ecstasy was over, um, someone asked Conchita if she had asked Our Lady anything, and she said, um, "Yes, I asked Our Lady why the bishop had published that published that note." And they asked her, "What did Our Lady answer?" And Conchita responded by saying, "The Virgin did not answer; she she just smiled." And so all of this just goes to say with the different connections between Garibandal and the Second Vatican Council that you really cannot affirm that Garibandal is against the Vatican Council or the Vatican Council is against the Garibandal. There's no opposition here. It also is clear that the Second Vatican Council is not the solution to everyone's problems. On the 11th of October 2012, Benedict XVI gave a talk about how to understand how to understand the the, um, the Second Vatican Council 50 years after, later. And Benedict XVI says that the whole point of Gaudium et Spes was kind of to bring things up to date, the aggiornamento that they often talk about. And he mentioned that the, the council wasn't successful in a lot of these things. There was a lot of tensions. There was a lot of um, discussion and disagreement even between the church fathers. There was one vote that took place between the church fathers. They were debating whether or not where to put one of the documents. And when the church fathers voted, it was almost a 50-50 split. There was heavy division at times between, between the fathers. But at the same time, we also have to affirm that the Lord guides the council. This vote that I just mentioned, it was a vote on the Marian document because the, the council knew that they were going to write about our Blessed Virgin, about our Blessed Mother, but they weren't sure whether to make it its own document or whether to include it within the document on the church. During the Second Vatican Council, there was a conference that took place in Fulda that was almost schismatic. Cardinal Rahner was there, and there were about 70 German, Austrian, and Swiss bishops there, also some from Scandinavia, France, and Belgium. And in this conference, they were talking about how they had to, Mariology should be taken out of the, um, of the council altogether because it's not an ecumenical topic. It could cause division.
And the second session of the Second Vatican Council, all of this was kind of talked about. And the end result of all this debate was that the document on Mariology was actually included at the end of Lumen Gentium instead of being its own independent document. This, this line that was behind the Fulda conference, they wanted to impede our Blessed Mother from being talked about as mediator. They had a very, they had a problem with this title, but mediator is included as one of the titles of our Blessed Mother in the Second Vatican Council. And so these theologians say that we cannot hide the disappointment we have experienced in seeing the title of Mediatrix applied to Mary. And many theologians kind of shared their opinion, but against all odds, the attempts to weaken the Marian presence at the council failed. And it failed to such an extent that some of these theologians conclude that even though they wanted to get rid of the references to Mary and they tried to weaken the Mariology by putting it inside a different document, it actually makes it stronger. Because Lumen Gentium, that document talks about the church. And so the fact that Mary appears at the end at the very last chapter of that document means that everything that has been said about the church culminates, so to speak, in this chapter about Mary. So there's, there's always a lot of, just as there are a lot of interpretations of the gospel, there's a lot of interpretations of Garibandal as well. And what we have to look at is the fruits, the conversions, everything that's going on in Garibandal, and even the attacks that are being, that, that Garibandal undergoes. The Lord says, blessed are the persecuted. Now it's, it's true that this is a subjective opinion that has to be sub submitted to the final decision of the church, but the, this final decision still has not come. This happened in the, as we saw before, with the, do the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. There was a time when the dogma had not yet been um, pro proclaimed, and so you could, you could, there was, you could either be in, in favor of it or against it because it wasn't, it wasn't certain yet. But once it was promulgated as a dogma, well, now you have to believe in it because it's a church dogma. And so something similar can happen here in Garibandal until the church makes its final pronouncement. The title given is, is non-constat. It's, it's an open case. It remains open and you're free to believe or not to believe. In the last apparition, Our Lady said, do you know, Conchita, why I didn't come to tell you those things in the second message? Because I was so sad to tell you such strong things, but you needed to know them. Our Lady doesn't tell us these things just for fun. She said, you needed to know them for God's glory and so that if you fulfill them for your own good. And I'd like to finish here with a quote from Maximilian Kolbe is right before the Second World War, he says to his brothers, times, difficult times are coming. But if you remember the graces you've received, it will help you later on. This is why our Blessed Mother comes as well. She comes with special graces and graces for you and for me to help us remain strong later on. So there's a couple of questions here. I'm going to see if I'm able to respond. What does it mean that Our Lady has appeared during the council? Okay, I see that it's kind of related in the same way that Garibandal is related to the Second Vatican Council. I see it in relation to what I mentioned at the beginning, the unity between the apparition of Our Lady in, in Guadalupe and the importance of, of the conversion of the people 
in Mexico in the Americas. Our Lady asked Juan Diego to ask the bishop to build a basilica. And the Indians realized there, oh, so the bishop must be very important. If Our Lady is asking permission from the bishop, then the bishop must be very important. And so it was very easy for the, in, for the Indians to understand the hierarchy. And so Garibandal encourages us to develop the fruits of the Second Vatican Council. We can't be discouraged by some of the fruits that came out just after the Council. It was, our, it was John Paul II who said, I see now the first fruits of the Second Vatican Council. Another question. Could you speak to us about the short duration of the pontificate of John Paul I? Where did Conchita talk about that? You can find this in a book written by Albert Weber. He died in 2014. He wrote a book and he was actually there the day that Conchita talked about this. He's a, a German. He's written several books about this. And this is he's the one who talks about it. It's in German. The book is in German, but there's a couple of translations into Spanish. Placido Ruilova also talks about this. He was a, a witness of the apparitions, and he talks about it as well in his notebooks. Ramon Perez also, I think, talks about it in his book, but I'm not sure. Um, Garibandal, The Town Speaks, is the name of that book. And then there's other people who say that that didn't happen. And there's, an, there's another well-known... Um, scholar of Garibandal. I, I don't like to get into this too much because we've kind of seen all of it already. Hello, Father. Thank you for what you said, the quote from from Pope Francis, who says that the, the main attitude has to be one of conversion. Could you talk a bit more about that? Sure. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, sometimes they asked her, what kind of difficulties did you have on your journeys? What kind of obstacles? Because I'm sure that there must have been a lot of, a lot of problems. Everyone wanted to, to see Mother Teresa and get their picture with her. But she never, ever, ever, ever spoke badly about anyone. She always said, oh, everything went well. Everything was perfect. And she says, conversion means giving fruit in my own life loving. The Lord says, be careful. Be careful with the Pharisees, be and they will take you before the, the tribune. And so be prudent, but be simple as well. Conversion means simplicity, humility, faith, hope, charity, all of the virtues that the church talks about. And these are the things that we have to attain looking at our Blessed Mother. Our Lady in Garbandal said to Garbandal, why, Conchita, why are you so lazy? Why don't you go visit the Blessed Sacrament where Jesus is waiting for us day and night? We can't be afraid to do things that kind of throw us off a little bit. The girls were asked during Lent to go pray the rosary at dawn, and, and they did this. And they said that at some at some point they couldn't even kneel really on on the street there because it was raining so hard. Why'd you stop going? Why'd you stop going then? Because our parents told us to stop going and our Blessed Mother told us, you always have to obey your parents and the priests even before what I tell you. That's tremendous. Good afternoon, Father. In Garbanda, Our Lady talks about a lot of things, but I'd like you to tell us about something that she's said to young people. Does Garibandal have anything to say to young people? I think the entire message of Garibandal has a very young spirit. Our Blessed Mother is asking us not to get comfortable. We shouldn't want to try to control things or just remain static. You have to be young, move. Stand up and, and be, behave, be good, do what you have to do. Everything that she says to the visionaries, they were young as well. When the apparitions ended, they were 16. So I would encourage you 
to read the last ecstasy that Conchita had. It's just a couple pages long. When Conchita was 17, Conchita talks about what Our Lady said to her on November 13th, 1965. She was chewing gum during the apparition. And Our Lady asks her, why don't you offer a sacrifice for, for my son? Why don't you offer him your gum? It's very, very simple things. She encourages young people to voluntarily take on sacrifices and to live their faith in a strong way. And if you don't, if you're not willing to do that, well, you're not really a Christian. If you live just according, like with the current, it's not enough. The world is going to eat you up. And Our Lady gives us some advice that is very important, especially in the apostolate with young people. She says, go to the tabernacle, pray the rosary, go out at dawn to look for our Blessed Mother, go out into the into nature and pray. She tells us to, to, to know how to value nature as well. Our Lady used, the girls used to go and, and pray in the pine trees, they would pray in the cemetery. They would go everywhere. Sometimes they would even leave, leave the village. I've listened, I've heard a lot of people use Garibandao to criticize priests. Could you let, maybe share with us a bit about what Our Lady said to priests? How can I respond? How can I respond? I think we've talked about this a bit already. And we've talked about how priests need conversion, obviously. As priests, we cannot, we cannot be bothered by the fact that Our Lady asks us to convert. This message of our, that Our Lady gave is not just for priests around Puente Nansa or around where the apparitions took place, it's for priests all over the world. Our Lady calls us to conversion, but at the same time, she says a lot of good things about the priests as well. A few weeks, months ago, I gave a talk on Garibandal and the priesthood. You can take a look at that as well, because there's a lot that goes on. There's a great love towards the hierarchy of the church. She speaks very well of the priests and asks us to pray for them. There's a lot of questions here, but I think we have to leave it now. We've enjoyed this talk and we give thanks to our Blessed Mother. And I would just ask that this bear fruit in our own soul and in others as well. The love of our Blessed Mother would touch many hearts. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We give thanks to you, O Lord, for the benefits that we have received from your great generosity. Through Christ our Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God and our Mother, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.